Good morning and welcome to the Thursday, March 10th meeting of the Minnesota House of Representatives Education Finance Committee. Remote hearings are held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This rule has been posted online and is linked to in our public meeting notice on the House website. All remote hearings will be recorded and live streamed by House Public Information Services. Members have the contents of their packets available to them, and for the public, these same materials have been posted online. Members, if you're looking for all these items in one place, they are attached to the calendar event you have that Ms. Burt sent for today. To get on the list to be recognized by the chair, members using the Zoom interface have the ability to raise their hand via the app. Ms. Burt will place your name on the list to be recognized. Mr. Lee, would you now take an oral roll call of members? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the roll call will commence now. Chair Dabney? Present. Representative Sandstead? Present. Representative Cresha? Present. Representative Bennett? Present. Representative Daniels? Present. Representative Damith? Present. Representative Drafkowski? Present. Representative Erickson? Erickson, present. Representative Feist? Present. Representative Jordan? Jordan, present. Representative Marcourt? Marcourt, present. Representative Mueller? Mueller, present. Representative Richardson? Present. Representative Thompson? Representative Thompson? Representative Walgamot? Wolgamot is present. Representative Schoen? Present. Representative Representative Joaquin? Present. All right, Mr. Chair, we have 16 members present and there's quorum. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Representative Mueller, have you had the opportunity to review the minutes from Wednesday, March 9th? And if so, would you move approval of those minutes? I have, Mr. Chair, and I'd move the minutes from March 9th. Thank you very much. Members, any discussion to the Mueller motion? Seeing none, members, this is a voice vote. Please unmute. All in favor of approving the minutes from Wednesday, March 9th, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion pre prevails. Thank you, Representative Mueller. Members, for today's hearing, we'll, we will be looking at several different cost drivers for school districts and tools that we can provide or enhance to support districts providing these services in cost-effective ways. For our first bill presentation, we'll be hearing from Representative Sandsteed about a bill that will update the transportation sparsity revenue percent. Members, it's our intention to lay this bill over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill by 10.55 a.m. Representative Sandsteed, would you like to make a motion to move House File 917 to be before the committee? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and Representative Stan Sandsteed, before you introduce your bill, I understand you have an author's amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill in the shape that you'd prefer? I do. Uh, members, I move the A1 amendment to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape that she prefers. Representative Sandsteed, can you speak briefly to the amendment? I can speak very briefly to this amendment. This amendment just changes the effective date from 2022 to 2023. Perfect. With that, members, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion prevails. Representative Sandsteed, to your uh, bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members. Today I am presenting House File 917. This is a bill that we heard last year. It is also a bill that we have heard many years previously. And I wanna take a moment to thank Representatives Detmer and Representative Bliss um, as a co-author on this bill. And Representative Detmer was the one who passed the initial legislation that we're asking to modify back in 2017. He and former Representative John Purcell have been chief authors of this legislation in the past, and I'm hopeful that we can finally take care of this statewide problem. This bill will address an issue that affects every corner of our state, from the Iowa border to the Canadian border, including districts in the metro area, 
some 80 schools are forced to take general fund dollars and shift them to their transportation costs. My testifiers today can paint pictures that they aren't the only school districts in the state that are forced to do this. It is a disappointment that we have to take much needed money from classrooms and services for students just to get our kids to school. I could go on and on about this bill, but it was heard last year, and I know members are, are pretty familiar with this issue. Even though we aren't able to get it across, or we weren't able to get it across the finish line last year, I'm hopeful that we will be able to help these school districts bring back some of those services to their students um, once they are at school, rather than having to use the money just to get them to school. Thank you, members. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to our testifiers, starting with Superintendent from the Forest Lake School area, uh, Superintendent Steve Massey. Superintendent Massey, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, my name is Steve Massey, uh, Superintendent for Forest Lake Area Schools. Mr. Chair, thank you for this opportunity. Representatives, Representative Sandsteed, and of course, Detmer and Bliss for their steadfast leadership on this important bill. And thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. Because of your background knowledge on this, I'll be very brief. Forest Lake Area Schools is a district just 25 miles north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Our district covers approximately 220 square miles and we enroll just under 6,000 students. Transportation, as you are aware, is based on student enrollment, not the miles a district must drive to get their students to school. Consequently, districts with a large geography and a dispersed housing, like Forest Lake, Bemidji, and some 80 other school districts across the state must offset their transportation costs with general fund dollars. Specifically, Forest Lake draws approximately $500,000 from the general fund every year to cover this transportation deficit. To offset this cost, over the last two years, we've reduced eight bus routes in the last two years alone, resulting in longer bus rides for every student in the district. We now have some students on buses for over two hours every day. And this is a district just outside of the metro or the, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. The issue is an issue of fairness and equity. Half a million dollars is equivalent to 10 teachers or critical services that we are not able to provide our students. To just take a moment to illustrate, if I may, a district with a smaller geography, a neighboring district to Forest Lake that is maybe 10 square miles, uh, compared to our district of 220 square miles, receives the same state um, per pupil um, formula for transportation as we do. That district will actually make money on transportation, whereas I illustrated before, we lose almost a half a million dollars a year because of the miles we have to drive and because the formula is tied to enrollment, not the actual miles driven. So specifically, uh, sent, um, House File 917 um, calls for an increase of the supplemental transportation sparsity rate from 18.2% where it's at today to 70%. This increase is consistent with the recommendation from the School Finance Task Force Working Group that was put together uh, several years ago um, uh, and a, a group that I was a member of. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd be happy to answer any questions after my colleague from Bemidji has a chance to testify. Thank you, Superintendent Massey. And speaking of your uh, colleague from Bemidji, we have Tim Lutz, Superintendent of the Bemidji Area Schools. Superintendent, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Tim Lutz. I'm the Superintendent of the Bemidji Area School District, and I've been with the district for four years now. Thank you, Representative Sandstead, for serving as the chief author of this bill, as well as Representatives Detmer and Bliss for co-authoring this bill. And thank you, Superintendent Massey, for your testimony and for setting the stage so well for my testimony on behalf of Bemidji Area Schools, which is an even larger district with longer bus rides in more buses, costing, therefore, even 
more money. The Bemidji Area School District serves approximately 4,800 students from pre-K to 12th grade and employs around 875 staff members. Bemidji is the county seat of Beltrami County, which as a county is the fourth largest in the state of Minnesota, covering nearly as much land mass as the states of Rhode Island or Delaware. There should be a map of our district overlaid on the metro area in the community packets to give a little perspective on how large our district is. If we could have staff help share that on the screen, if possible, that would be very helpful. Because you know, if a picture paints a thousand words, this is a prime example. I'll pause just a second to see if we can get that map up here. Ms. Ms. Bird, are you able to accommodate Superintendent Lutz's request? Sure, just one moment. Excellent, thank you. And what I could do is uh, lead into that a little bit more by explaining that the Bemidji School District is one of three districts in Beltrami County. The boundaries of ISD 31, Bemidji Area Schools, encompass 825 square miles. I compared the county to a state earlier, but this 825 mi square miles is roughly two thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island. So our district is two thirds the size of Rhode Island. As we overlay the map of the district over the metro area, you can see that it stretches from Albertville in the north <clears throat> to Rosemount in the southeast, while the city of Bemidji proper is about the size of the Richfield school district. And that's why we see that black box with the square over what is Bemidji proper. You can see Lake Bemidji there. And Richfield proper would be one of those, or Richfield would be one of those school districts that is much more condensed and probably doing a whole lot better with this funding formula of transportation. We have over 70 buses that drive over 1 million miles a year due to our size. Our average bus ride is between an hour and a half to two hours. Some of our students are on the bus for two and a half hours one way, and that length of the bus ride has gotten worse for some students because we have had to merge and consolidate some routes in order to save funding because of our losses every year. Because we are such a large district and have had students have students living in such a sparsely populated area, we end up driving so many more miles per student than these tightly populated urban school districts. As a result, that standard funding formula is just not enough for us in Bemidji or Forest Lake or some of the other districts. And we run into a deficit up here in Bemidji of roughly $800,000 every year in transportation costs. This is an incredible hit to our budget and dramatically affects our programs and our staffing each and every year. This takes funding resources out of the classroom where our funds should really remain. So I would echo wholeheartedly that districts should not have to use general fund dollars geared for the classroom just to get kids to school. This has also become a safety issue for our district. We need to hold onto our buses for a longer period of time because we can't afford to keep rotating and purchasing new buses. So we hold on to them for an average of 10 years and we put those buses through the ringer by running so many miles, all while losing $800,000 each of these years. Therefore, along with keeping money out of the classroom, we find ourselves unable to keep our bus purchase rotation up to date and current due to those funding losses, which also is you know, causing our safety issues to exacerbate even more and more money needing to be spent for repair parts or for mechanics who work in our garages. In short, the transportation formula that exists currently is simply not enough and is not working in the Bemidji area schools. And we're asking for your support through this bill so that school districts like Forest Lake, Bemidji area schools, and about 80 others may be made whole again. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I am available for questions as well. Thank you, Superintendent Lutz. When this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of this bill hearing. We received no requests for public testimony. Questions from members, Representative Erickson. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Could Mr. Strom uh, help us understand what the increase would be uh, in state uh, cost for this change? Mr. Strom? Mr. Chair, Representative Erickson, yes, there's a printout in your packet, and I'm sorry for the delay in getting that to the committee members, that shows uh, the, the increase in revenue. Uh, the, the data for FYA 21 and 22 look a little bit different than in the November forecast. So our current estimate of the raising the percentage from 18.2% to 70% has a cost of $11.5 million. Uh, the PDF of the printout will show those amounts for each of the districts. Uh, if you were to scroll down on the printout to district uh, uh, number 31, which is Bemidji, you'd see the $832,000 gap between the estimated expenditures and revenue for the district and the additional 431,000 this bill would provide the uh, uh, the district if it were enacted. Uh, the Forest Lake School District's number is uh, District 831, and there you'll see the, the spending gap in the third to last column at $777,000, with the bill providing uh, $402,000. Uh, again, my apologies for the lateness in the printout uh, uh, coming to members, uh, we had a little difficulty updating to the February data, but about 11.5 million per year is the top number. Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Strom, that's ongoing, correct? Mr. Strom? Mr. Chair, Representative Erickson, yes, that would be thank annual. You. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Representative Uakin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to thank Representative Sandstead for. Um, bringing this bill forward. A few years ago, I had the opportunity when I was up in Bemidji with family to visit the school district, take a wonderful tour, see some of the great work they're doing, especially around their um, their strands of academies in their junior high, in their high schools. But one thing they did show me was their bus barn and what the superintendent isn't saying is those 70 buses, most of them have to spend their time outside too, which affects their lifespan as well. But the one thing that stuck with me on that trip besides the academic work they're doing was this map that they had up on their wall. And to see, to give you the scale um, in what we in the metro area can imagine, driving from um, Albertville to Rose Mountain, out to Stillwater where I grew up, and then down to Shakopee is a huge trek. And these kiddos are spending a lot of time on buses. If we could get them a little bit of help just to make, make a dent in this cross subsidy, I think it'd be well worth it. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Draskowski, I see your hand up. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe Mr. Strom can help me. I had a bill a, a couple of years ago when I noticed um, in talking to school districts in my legislative district, one school district was driving deliberately uh, deeply into the neighboring school district in order to uh, recruit more kids so that they can get, uh, get more money on their uh, per pupil uh, payment. And so I'm just remembering, Mr. Chair, as I thought about that and wrote the bill, and maybe Mr. Strom, you can help out, but we were paying, the taxpayers were paying twice uh, in that situation. I'm wondering, and I'd be interested, the, the, the two schools that, that we heard from, um, what their experience is and if they're doing the same thing uh, in that area to you know, go, go try to recruit more kids to, to increase revenue in your general fund uh, while incurring additional costs in transportation. Mr. Strom, do you remember? Can you help? Uh, can I phone a friend, Mr. Strom? Mr. Mr. Strom? Mr. Chair, Representative Draskowski. Uh, yes, I suspect that both superintendents are, are best to address what happens in their district with, with open enrollment. The other thing I would add is that in some parts of the state, particularly uh, uh, areas like Bemidji, there may be reasons why the school district boundary is a bit odd so that the bus may be coming through part of a different district. There may be parts of the district that it's it's coming through us uh, 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 separately because that's that's where the road goes essentially to get from one part of the district to the other. Um, but the, I think the issue you speak to is much more common in areas with uh, districts that are closer together than either those that uh, uh, Forest Lake or, or Bemidji faces. But Mr. Chair, it might be best for the superintendents to both address their 
open enrollment costs that, that are coming into their, their total unfunded gap. Thank you, Mr. Strom. Would either superintendent care to comment on this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to comment. I, I, superintendent Lutz. I, I can tell you that we're not doing anything deliberately. We do uh, take in open enrolled students, but that's based, it's driven by families and parents who apply to have their children come to Bemidji. And unfortunately here in Bemidji, we are operating in a net loss when it comes to students coming in and students enrolling out. We lose more students. And uh, we also lose a lot of students, not only to other school districts in our county or neighboring counties, but we lose students to several private schools and four other charter schools while still having to transport them. So even though we have a net loss of students enrolling out than in, our boundaries are still what they are, and we still have to drive many of these students who are charter school students and private school students. So that gives an even greater hit for us than some of these schools who may be deliberately recruiting students. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I would only add to that to say Superintendent that- Massey. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the only thing I would add to that is open enrollment is, as Superintendent Letts indicated, um, driven by the parent. We, we pick up students who may be just over our border because the bus is in that neighborhood. Uh, we don't stretch beyond that to pick up other open enrolled students. And I believe the funding is simply going to be the per pupil funding, the 4.66% of that that's allocated to transportation that would follow that student from another district open enrolled into Forest Lake. I don't believe there's a double hit for the taxpayers because the taxpayers aren't paying specifically on a referendum tied to transportation. Thank you, Superintendent. Representative Drazkowski, any follow-up? Not really, Mr. Chair. I just, I just think it's something we as a committee need to think about. And it's still not resolved in, the, in, in my district here. The one school district is deliberately driving into the neighboring town uh, to recruit and pick up kids. And uh, not only is, are the buses in the neighboring school district driving there and all around, but you've got uh, their, their neighbor who's recruiting them going in and driving too. So I guess maybe some of the, the duplication for the taxpayer would be, we're covering the same roads with two neighboring school districts. And I think we need to be cognizant of this as we, as we bring policy forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. With that, Representative Sandsteed, any closing comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I think uh, Superintendent Lutz did a nice job pointing to this, but all of our schools in the state of Minnesota are facing um, a, a loss of student enrollment, or I should say most of them <clears throat> as a result of COVID, excuse me. And with that has come a reduction in um, funding for our schools. And when it comes to transportation, even though our enrollment may be down, the footprint does not change for these school districts. And so what was already problematic prior to this session um, has just been even exacerbated now by COVID. And I think that the, the timing of this bill is has never been more important to our public schools. So I just wanna thank the members for your time today. Um, when you've been around long enough, you know that oftentimes it takes more than one go at it to get legislation passed. Um, and this one certainly is a problem that's been around for a while. I hope that we're able to make the strategic investments um, for our school districts. So they, they aren't taking from the general fund to actually, uh, or in, in, as a result, taking away from students, taking away from the needs that they, they truly need right now. Um, this is one of the areas that I hope that we can all agree on that needs to be addressed. And with that, Mr. Chair, I just uh, would ask for your support on this bill. Thank you, Representative Sandsteed. And with that, Representative Sandsteed renews her motion to lay over House File 917 as amended for possible inclusion or further consideration at a later date. Thank you. Uh, also note that Representative Thompson has joined us. For our next bill hearing, we have House File 3232 from Representative Marcourt. It's our intention to lay this bill over by 1120 a.m. Representative Marcourt, would you like to make a motion to move House File 3232 before the committee and to lay it over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? Mr. Chair, I'll move House File 3232 be laid over for possible inclusion into the uh, education finance omnibus bill. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Representative Marquardt, uh, before you introduce the bill, I understand you have an author's amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill into the shape you'd prefer. I'll move the A1 amendment to be before the committee to put Mr. the bill Chair, in the shape I, that you desire. Representative Marquardt, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A1 amendment. Yeah, you, A, A1 amendment, and it, it takes a higher number and replaces it with a lower number, which I know the Education Finance Committee will always appreciate. Thank you for that. Members, any discussion to the Marquardt motion on the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape that he prefers? Seeing none, again, this is a voice vote. Please unmute your microphones. All in favor of the Marquardt motion on the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion prevails. Representative Marquardt then, to your bill as amended. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. And I have to say, I've been having an unstable internet connection this morning. So I'm in my office here at the state office building, but I've been having some problems. But uh, at any rate, uh, this bill is really a, a practical change uh, in school finance that would help school districts better meet the needs of their students and actually would take our limited school dollars uh, further to educate our children and to be able to take care of our facilities. And this was brought to me by uh, several area superintendents and it involves two programs, the long-term facility maintenance program, which was started in 2015 and uh, you know, districts have to come up with a 10 year plan for deferred maintenance. And the other program is the operating capital revenue. And the operating capital revenue uh, can be used for capital, equipment, facility needs, uh, those type of things. But one thing unique about the operating capital reserve account, and both of these are reserved accounts, is that where you can spend general fund dollars for capital needs, you cannot use this operating capital reserve account or general fund, general fund educational purposes. So here's, here's the situation that a lot of school districts are in, is that they might be real heavy in one year in capital expenses. So textbooks, computers, uh, even deals with asbestos or removal, all those type of things. And they might be light in deferred maintenance, which is a long-term facility maintenance. Um, so what happens is, in a lot of cases, is these school districts will supplant the need in the capital with general fund spending. So they'll take their general fund spending that goes for uh, teachers and counselors, instructional, and they will kind of cover this deficit uh, for the capital needs for that year. So what this bill would allow is for in those type of situations under a board resolution where you could take dollars from the long-term facility maintenance reserve account and move it over to the operating capital reserve account. So for example, if you could do that, if um, a school wanted to add a new counselor, uh, but let's say they had money they had to put in the capital, basically, they wouldn't have those dollars. This now saves more dollars into the general fund. So in effect, what we have in many cases is an operating capital cross subsidy. <laughs> so you're, you know, and if they were able to move from the long-term facility maintenance to the operating capital, uh, which are very related, um, that would keep more money into the general fund for instructional purposes. The other part of the bill deals with the age factor. And I'll just state this very quickly because I've got a number of superintendents who would like to testify, is that right now there's a 35 year, to get the highest building index of 1.0 is 35 average age. So you might have a district that has, a, let's say 100,000 square feet. That age is 35 years. But they now add a new building of 50,000 square feet. That new building is going to lower that average of 35 years lower and their building index goes down and they lose funding. And yet they still got the entire 100,000 feet that was 35 years old. Their deferred maintenance costs do not go down. So a big part of this bill would say that if you keep the existing 100,000 
1,000 square feet, and you add on, you would not have your building index lowered. So that's kind of, a, again, in short, this bill is allowing school districts more uh, flexibility. But at this point, I'll turn it over to my testifiers, Mr. Chair, or answer questions at this point. Thank you, Representative Marquardt. Let's go to uh, testifiers. First up is Brandon Lunak, Superintendent of the Moorhead Public Schools. Superintendent, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you. My name's Brandon Lunak. I'm Superintendent of Moorhead Area Schools. I'd like to thank uh, Paul uh, for co-authoring this bill. Uh, so quite frankly, this bill uh, is, is huge for not only just uh, the Moorhead Area Public Schools, but uh, um, many of the schools across the state. And, and I'll just give you some specific examples in Moorhead. So on the operating capital side, uh, the Moorhead area public schools on an average uh, spends about 3.5 million in capital expenses per year. The operating capital formula generates about 1.2 million. And we make up that difference uh, with a transfer of our general fund revenue uh, into the operating capital to make that um, to make that program whole, and like uh, uh, Representative Marquardt said, uh, we take that money out of our general fund, which which makes it very difficult to uh, add or do any type of uh, programming academically, as we need to meet our capital needs as well. And and it's not as if uh, we don't uh, scrutinize every capital expense uh, either. Uh, we put that through the ringer, but we do, which I found was interesting, um, your previous testifiers on the transportation bill, we include uh, purchasing our buses in that capital rotation as well. And uh, we, try to, we try to turn those over uh, buses every 12 years, but uh, we buy two a year to make that happen. And so uh, right now, that's the, the, uh, the, big, the big thing we're asking for here is some flexibility and between the two restricted funds so we can loosen up or preserve some of the unassigned uh, dollars in fund one for some academic programming. On the term, on the LTFM side of things, uh, we were hit hard in Moorhead as a result of the construction of uh, a new elementary school and a large addition to our middle school, uh, which brought our average age from 32 down to 26, and we didn't shed any facilities mm. in the process. And so uh, we continue to lose uh, the potential for LTFM dollars there as well. Um, I know there's other testifiers uh, here as well, uh, but I'll be available for questions uh, should the committee have any uh, when we're all wrapped up. Thank you, Superintendent Lunick. Next, Phil Jensen, Superintendent of the Hawley Public Schools. Superintendent, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Phil Jensen, Superintendent, Hawley Public Schools. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, good. I'm, a, I'm on my phone right now. Um, very similar to what Superintendent Lunick was talking about. For us in Hawley, we spend just short of a half million dollars on average for our, our capital. And we generate just a little bit less than 250,000. So we're, we're, we're taking, uh, you know, anywhere from 250 to 275 each year out of our general fund. recording in progress again recording again, stopped again uh that's on an average so it just gives us the flexibility uh as we move through some of those high years uh, curriculum review cycles things like that where um for example we're doing a, a, a english language arts curriculum and uh that's it to the tune of about 180,000 for k through five that takes a big chunk of, of the capital right there. Again, uh, appreciate your support on this and I appreciate uh, Representative Marquardt's work on it and uh, I'll be available for questions as well. Thank you very much, Superintendent Jensen. Next on my list is Blaine Novak, Superintendent of the New York Mills Public Schools. Superintendent Novak, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Blaine Novak was having tech difficulties. He had texted me. He got kicked out. He said he was having troubles with his connectivity as well. But he just expressed the uh, concern and the willingness as a small school for your support in terms of that same flexibility that I talked about and uh, Phil Jensen talked about. Basically, it's the same need just to a different, uh, different tune in terms of uh, how much money you have to move back and forth based on population and, and size of district. 
Thank you, Superintendent Lunak. Hopefully, Superintendent Novak will be able to join us. Next, then, I have Christy Werner, the business manager for the Perham Public Schools. Ms. Werner, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Christy Warner. I'm the business manager for the Perham Dent Public School District. Thank you for inviting me to speak before you today. Um, as we've talked about, House File 3232 has several components, which would all be beneficial to Minnesota schools. But today, I just wanted to speak uh, about the importance of allowing local control to make decisions on the use of long-term facility maintenance, or LTFM, and operating capital revenue. The flexibility in allowing school boards to make the decision of where funding is needed most would have a huge impact for schools and also for students. Um, as you know, LTFM revenue can be used for a number of things, but primarily it's used for deferred capital and maintenance projects. I've heard it best described that if you could take a school building and shake it upside down, everything that doesn't fall out is the facility. And that is what schools can use long-term facility maintenance for. Um, the things that fall out of the school in this scenario are the things that a district often uses operating capital revenue to purchase. Things like computers, software, copiers, textbooks, vehicles, and buses. The needs in school districts for these type of purchases far exceeds the amount of operating capital that a district receives as restricted revenue. This analogy shows how the restricted revenue is currently allowed to be spent. However, each school district may have a greater need in one area versus another. For example, the Perm Dent School District has been lucky enough to have voters approve the building of a new high school and updates to our elementary and middle school buildings. While we certainly still have facility needs, at the present time, a greater need in our district is for the things that have fallen out of the building. This bill would allow school districts to annually, or school boards to annually make a determination to transfer reserve funds from LTFM to operating capital in those years when there are unspent dollars remaining in the restricted LTFM revenue fund. And when they have expenses that exceed the amount that we're given for operating capital revenue. This change will allow school boards to maximize the available funding for the benefit of their students. I'm available for any questions as well. Thank you, Ms. Werner. And last on my list of testifiers is Wayne Miller, the finance supervisor for Region 1 ESV. Mr. Miller, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. I'm Wayne Miller. Um, I work at a service co-op in Moorhead where we furnish financial help for 90 districts in Northwest Minnesota. Um, I'll come from the perspective of, of maybe an overview of the 90 districts we represent, which most of them are um, smaller enrollment. And what I see for especially operating capital is how varied the needs are. And if you were to ask for a report from MDE that says, show me what they're spending in operating capital, uh, you won't see what they're spending because operating capital is not allowed to go in deficit without a special operating plan. And districts try to avoid that because that's got to be approved by the commissioner. So what they do, if especially for a small district, if they got to buy a bus one year, that's going to consume all their operating capital. Well, then they make all their operating capital purchases um, out of unrestricted revenue. And so I see that as I review data before we send that to MDE. And um, I would guess probably 75% of our districts each year um, have to make this call it what you want, unofficial transfer to spend part of their unrestricted uh, in operating capital. Um, I'm also available for questions, but I think that's um, what I was trying to reinforce. All right, thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, members, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of this bill hearing. We received no requests from the public to testify. Questions from members? Representative Erickson, I see you're, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Marquardt, uh, could he answer a question for me? Go ahead. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And Representative Marquardt, this is a, a really good bill. Uh, I like the fairness of it. Uh, I noticed all your uh, testifiers are from your area of the state. So my first question would be, 
is this agreeable to our, our East Central Minnesota area and other areas of the state? Uh, and then uh, my second question is, is there any downside to making this change? Representative Marquardt. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Representative Erickson. I have not talked to other areas of the state. I, I think what you're hearing though, is that this is a statewide uh, concern. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think it probably would apply. And what was, I, I guess I missed the second part of your question, Representative. Is there any downside oh, to this? So, yeah, no, I thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Erickson. Well, I don't see a downside, you know, on this, this part, we're not asking for any new state funding. Right. It's basically, and the long-term facility maintenance and operating capital are very much related. It's facilities and equipment. They're somewhat different, but very related. And so if you've got an excess in one, you just be kind of using that and, and school boards would have to annually come back and ask for it. But it's gonna allow these dollars to stretch further uh, without you know having to ask for more funding. I, I just think it's, it's going to impact all districts. I don't see a downside, but I'm sure that there might be. I don't know. I, I don't know what that would be. Representative Erickson, any follow-up? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I think Representative Markward answered uh, my questions uh, very well. And uh, I, I think this, this is a good bill. Thank you. Representative Ewakeen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Representative Marquardt. I can always count on you to think outside the box and find things that'll help. Um, this shows that our districts do need flexibility, but it also shows that they're having to be creative to stretch dollars to the breaking point, and that we really need to add more money into the system, too. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the equalization bills and, and discussion around that, but I appreciate this, and I very much appreciate Ms. Werner's analogy of everything that falls out of the skull when you tip it upside down. You, in one, in one sentence, explain the difference for me between LTFM and um, operating maintenance. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Ewakeen. Any other questions from members? Seeing none, Representative Marquardt, any closing comments? Well, again, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. And all of the great ideas I have today came from the superintendents <laughs> that you heard from. So I really want to thank all of them for bringing this forward. And it just, to me, it's very common sense. It's practical. We're not asking for new money and it would uh, stretch dollars further for meeting the needs of our students. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Representative Marquardt. With that, Representative Marquardt renews his motion to lay over House File 3232 as amended for possible inclusion or further consideration at a later date. Members, our next bill uh, is House File 3224 from Representative Hewitt. It's our intention to refer this bill to the Tax Committee by 11.50 a.m. Representative Jordan, would you like to make a motion to move House File 3224 to before the committee and refer it to the Committee on Taxes? So move, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Representative Hewitt, welcome to the committee. Please introduce your Bill. <clears throat> Representative Hewitt, you need to unmute. I missed my great opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's great to be back in front of a committee I feel at home. And uh, Mr. Chair and members, lowering property taxes and reducing education funding disparities throughout. School levy equalization is a topic I and many of us have introduced bills over the years. It's our job as state legislators to, find, to fund public school. And to the extent that property taxes are part of the school funding system, we should make sure that, that we imp, implement it fairly across districts and classes of property. The surplus gives us an opportunity to take a comprehensive look at the effectiveness of the school levy system. Because this, the equalization formula is based on 1990 property values, the property tax relief has eroded over time. Now taxpayers in low property wealth school districts can pay over three times more than the same levy dollar than taxpayers in higher property wealth districts. We like to say, 
the quality of a child's education shouldn't depend on their zip code. Members, this gives us, this bill gives us a chance to deliver in meaningful way on the kind of, of talk. Early this session, I met with some of our school groups and we talked through a, a list of ideas and approach to, to create more levy fairness across the state. House file 3224 provides a permanent property tax relief and makes the taxpayer cost for school levy dollars more uniform across the state, keeping the state in steady partnership with local schools over time. Specifically, the bill increases the state aid portion through equalization, equalization for, the, for three school levies, the operating referendum and the local, oper, uh, local optional revenue, which provides operating revenue for schools. And it also debt service levy, which pays for the building bond. The equalization formula is linked to the state's average market value. So the property tax relief is permanent and will not erode over time. This bill also gives local school boards some modest revenue options and options in facility maintenance needs. And it closes some regional inequities that have existed for too long. Mr. Chair, I want to note a letter of support from pretty much every public school organization support this bill. Before I go further, I wanna make sure the testifiers get time and there is a list, Mr. Chair. I turn it back to you. Thank you, Representative Hewitt. First on the list uh, is Mark Stotts, Director of Finance and Operations for ISD 196. Mr. Stotts, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mark Stotts, I'm the Director of Finance and Operations for the Rosemount Apple Valley School District. Chair Dabney, members of the committee, thanks for allowing us to testify today on this very important issue. Um, we talk about equalization aid uh, a lot in education circles and in a district like ours, um, we are heavily residential, not as much commercial industrial property um, within our district. And so at this point in time, we do not receive any equalization aid on our operating referendum or our local option revenue. Um, if this bill was to be implemented, we'd receive approximately 21 cents on the dollar, um, which would be significant for the property taxpayers in our district. Um, again, you know, the whole concept behind equalization aid is that a taxpayer in Rosemount shouldn't pay more for the same dollar that a taxpayer in another district does. And so we wholly support this bill and we thank Representative Hewitt for bringing it forward. Thank you, Mr. Stotts. Next, Mark Mat Matuska, Superintendent of the Cass on Mantraville Public Schools. Superintendent Matuska, welcome to the committee, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Mark Matuska. I'm the superintendent of schools at Casson Manterville. Mr. Chair, Representative Hewitt and members of the House Committee, uh, thanks for uh, letting us uh, join you today. Before I get started, I'd like to thank many of you who are involved with the Ag Bond Credit, or what we call Ag to School funding that was provided to our Minnesota farmers a few years back that reduction in property taxes for our uh, farmers throughout Minnesota on their total acres has been very well received in our part of the state and throughout. And as you know, will be remembered and appreciated by them for many years to come. Uh, today, I'm honored to support House Bill 3224 that is before the committee, specifically an increase in the debt service equalization mm -hmm. aid that will dramatically reduce the property tax increases for our local businesses, the homes and one acre for our farming families, in addition to our household residents living in Casson and Manorville. And Casson and Manorville is not alone. School districts like Byron, Pine Island, Stewartville, Farmington, St. Michael, just to name a few, they're all growing, yet we have extremely low property wealth due to a lack of industry. Nearly all of these districts have also either recently renovated or built new facilities that have increased their debt service payments Historically, we've had over 11% of that debt service equalized by the state, yet that figure has recently dropped below uh, 3%. In fact, it stayed there for about the last five to six years. Uh, House File 3224 gets it right. 
as written, the cost of this increase in debt service equalization aid is a little under 50 million and the number of districts that would qualify would certainly increase. And for those of us who already qualify for that debt service aid, we would likely see an increase as well. This bill simplifies the process by creating a single tier of equalization at about 100% or at 100% of the statewide average of net tax capacity. In addition, it sets that th the threshold for state eligibility at 10% instead of the old 15.74, which was the old tier two. And for a district like Cass and Manorville, uh, the increased state aid would result in a reduction of ta and taxes for our constituents of nearly $1 million annually. Keep in mind, these are not additional dollars for school districts, they're a reduction in taxes for our constituents. So as communities continue to grow, new school buildings will always need to be built. And for those schools with higher property tax wealth, the impact on the taxpayers is significantly lower than many of the districts that I mentioned earlier that have low property tax wealth. For this reason, I ask that you please support House Bill 3224. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hewitt, and members of the committee for your time and future support of this legislation. And I'll be available for any questions. Thank you, Superintendent, Superintendent Matuska. Uh, Representative Krisha, uh, we've got three more testifiers. Uh, is this a question uh, specifically at this time? Just getting on the list, Mr. Chair. You're there. Thank you, Representative Krisha. Next, Seth, excuse me, Seth Putz, Building and Grounds Health and Safety Supervisor for Lake of the Woods Public Schools. Mr. Putz, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Morning, Mr. Chair and committee members from the walleye capital of the world. I just want to say I'm very humbled that my voice gets to be heard this morning. My name is Seth Putz, and I'm the Buildings, Grounds, and Health Safety Supervisor for Lake of the Woods School District. This morning, I want to let you know how important it is to smaller districts like ours to increase the per student dollar amount for LTFM. We're a district of 3,771 persons. This school was built in 1992 when there was a student body of roughly 900 students. When there was, and the building is 229,000 square feet in size. Moving to the present, we currently have a student body of 487. There's been a significant drop in enrollment from then till now. The building has not changed and the upkeep has become more expensive when, with inflationary pressures and construction materials. An increase of 120 per student adds about 58,000 to the LTFM budget for us. This increase will help update our HVAC control system, resurface our track, which is in need of repair, among other projects on our list. It gives me hope that we can continue to maintain and upgrade the building and grounds as things fail or become obsolete. I'm very glad there is a program like the LTFM that is solely dedicated to the maintenance and upkeep of the school. This program has been tremendously helpful to smaller school districts. It allows you to plan and budget that need to be done. Without its sole dedication to the facility side of the school, it'd be very difficult to find a way to finance it. Thank you for your time to hear me. Mr. Putz, thank you for that. And we're uh, thrilled to have your voice as part of our deliberations as well. Next on the Thank list you. is Deb Marcotte, Executive Director of the Hiawatha Valley Education District. Ms. Marcotte, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Deb Marcotte, greetings, Chair Davney and members of the Education Finance Committee. I am the Executive Director of Hiawatha Valley Education District. HVED is made up of 13 member districts located in the very southeast corner of Minnesota, surrounding the city of Winona. HVED's total student population is 12,000. I'm here today to offer support for HF 3224, specifically the provision creating a modest but much needed levy option for cooperative educational facilities. I have four key points to share as I urge you and the committee to champion this legislation. Number one, intermediate districts in the metro area already have the $65 per pupil levy authority. Cooperatives and education districts in greater Minnesota do not. This creates a significant inequity for Minnesota students. Because HVED does not have this levy authority, HVED has been forced to secure leftover spaces for our specialized programming. We currently operate six separate sites 
with over an hour commute between some of them. The limited spaces plus limited staffing creates conditions that are terribly inefficient to operate. We have some of our highest needs students traveling well over an hour each way to get to and from their school with appropriate programming. This is because we do not have the $65 levy authority to secure any one space that can accommodate all of our programming in one place. Moving on to number three, the $65 levy authority grants us the authority to levy. This levy authority is enacted only if it is agreed upon by all 13 member districts. Since HVET has been struggling with facilities for 10 years, we have had ample opportunity to request preliminary information regarding the tax impact. As of August 25th, 2021, a $3 million lease would cost HVED taxpayers residing in a $300,000 home between $5 and $14 annually. This relatively small impact to our taxpayers provides a tremendous benefit to our students. Number four, I am writing a proposal to Minnesota State College Southeast to lease a property on their Winona campus that has great potential for HVED. All 13 member districts agree this is the right property in the right location and will provide opportunity for growth as we serve special needs students across Southeast Minnesota. The problem is that without the $65 levy authority, some of our member districts cannot commit. I will complete this proposal due March 28th, trusting that the $65 levy authority will move forward and we will finally be able to begin combining our six sites. Again, I urge you to champion this critical legislation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Marcotte. And last on my list, Brad Lundell, Schools for Equity in Education. Mr. Lundell, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Brad Lundell. I'm the Executive Director of uh, Schools for Equity Education, and I'm honored today to voice our organization's support for House File 3224, which would be a monumental step toward bringing greater and ongoing tax fairness to school districts throughout Minnesota. Addressing disparities in school funding that arise from differences in property wealth has been the primary focus of Schools for Equity and Education since the organization's inception in 1979. But as witnessed by the letter referenced by Representative Hewitt, it is clear that we are not alone in supporting this effort to provide greater tax fairness for property taxpayers throughout Minnesota. The discussion of the interplay between the property tax system and the education funding system dates back more than 50 years when the Minnesota Miracle was passed in 1971. Progress has been made since that time to mitigate the problems caused by differential levels of property wealth between school districts and how that affects educational opportunities. I point out the 1991 establishment of the referendum and debt service equalization programs as part of that progress. But that progress has come in fits and starts. House file 3224 would improve on that foundation and would both increase state participation in a number of school levies and preserve that level of support by indexing the increased, increased equalization factors to statewide growth in property wealth. Without diving too deeply into the weeds, it needs to be pointed out that a number of current equalizing factors fall below the state average in terms of property wealth. Both tiers of the operating levy, the second tier of the local option revenue, and the first tier of the debt service levy all fall short of statewide average property wealth. Further, because the equalization factor for the local option revenue and operating referendum categories are not indexed to statewide property wealth growth, those pro programs lose value as local property wealth increases. Before I wrap up, I want to stress that as much as this is an education issue, it is also a tax issue, and it has always been a tax issue. Speaking from my perspective, I believe the funding for this initiative is most appropriately handled in the tax target. Minnesota's budget situation is in a strong position, providing the legislature with the opportunity to take a substantial step, a step that will last to address the issue of how property wealth disparities affect educational opportunities. We all saw the compelling testimony provided by two South St. Paul students last week, outlining the challenges faced in that district because of its low property wealth. House file 3224 would go a long way toward addressing the issues that they brought to the committee's attention. I urge your strong support for House File 3224. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindell. Uh, Representative Krisha, custom is for the minority lead to have the last word. That's uh, correct. Rep Representative Yukim has her hand up. Do you, do yep. you want to go Just first? give me closing comments for our side. Just fine. Representative Yukim, I see your hand up. 
Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I actually have a question real quick, just to make sure I heard right. Superintendent, uh, who is it, Matuska? You had mentioned that currently the um, debt equalization is, you used to be able to get about, on the debt service aid, about 11%, now you're down to about three. Was that accurate? Superintendent Matuska? Chair Davney and uh, Representative Yukum, that is accurate. Uh, we were at 11%, uh, I think, as early as uh, I'm going to say, and I could defer to Brad Lundell as well, but I'd say within the last 15 years, and just uh, about six, five or six years ago, it dropped under 3%, and it's maintained that level at under 3% since then. Representative Joachim? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Superintendent. And I just bring that up because I want us to realize that formulas over time at least need to be rebased. As you heard before, we are looking at values from 1990. To give you an idea of that, I know my own house has gone up two and a half times since its price we bought it for in 1997. And if you look, I just Googled just for fun, um, not that everything on the internet is totally accurate, but the website that I looked at was um, a gallon of milk in 1990 was $1.25. It's $3.32 now. So at least rebasing the formula is the least we can do that we owe our students. Um, as we've talked about before, this formula is the cake that holds our, that, that we bake, that holds our, <laughs> our schools together. And equalization helps us so that a child's zip code doesn't determine the type of education that they get, as it should not. It's really important to do equalization and to fix this formula over time, even if it's just rebasing it. And also the fact, just even if you look at the, um, you wanna talk about long-term help and financial help for every citizen in our state that owns a piece of property, this is property tax cuts that would reach every corner of the state. And they'd be ongoing and give some folks some relief. So. Um, as we know, too, property taxes are one of the more regressive taxes that we have. So if we really want to get great bang for a buck, equalizing our formula, making sure students have what they need to be successful in the classroom and not have that depend on their zip code, and then also give taxpayers some relief, this is the bill for you. So I just want to thank folks that put it together and look, looking forward to seeing what this looks like on the other end. Thank you, Representative Joachim, a pretty strong endorsement from the Chair of the Property Tax Division. Uh, seeing no other hands up, Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Marcourt, thank you for bringing this bill up. Uh, I have actually less issue with the bill and more with the, the lack of information. Do we have the local, do we have available the local levy impact information? I haven't seen that yet. Uh, for, and the district runs for, for this. Mr. Strom? I'm going to throw that one to you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Krisha, my apologies. I've been running a little behind on the data update from the February forecast, and I will hopefully have those runs done by the end of the week and uh, share them with, with all of you. I apologize for this. It's been a little harder year than some for me to get this all updated, but uh, those, those will be broken out for each of the categories, for the debt service, for the uh, uh, for the local optional revenue and for the operating referendum. And as I said, I hope by the end of the week to have those to you, apologies. So uh, Mr. Strom, it sounds like they'll be uh, prepared well in advance for consideration by the tax committee. <laughs> Let's hope Mr. Chair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Strom. Representative Krisha. Thank you, and, and Mr. Strom, I certainly don't mean to put any undue burden on you. That's not the nature of my question. But I, I will put it this way, we, we are the Education Finance Committee, and while I realize this is heading to the Tax Committee, I think that just out of respect for the committee and, and our jurisdiction, having those runs would be very important. So this question is actually to Representative Marcourt, and I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I am trying to be uh, respectful of our decision making here. This is an educational issue, and as a former chair of the Education Finance Committee, you might appreciate this. And don't you think to the chair that we should have those runs before we make that decision? We're not gonna miss any timelines and slowing this down and, and giving the members of this committee those runs would seem to be the right thing before we just move this out and let that decision happen on the tax committee. Mr. Chair, would you be open to that? No, Representative uh, Marquardt. Marquardt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Krisha. You know, I, if it wasn't going to taxes, I would say yes. 
but the fact that it is going to the taxes committee, uh, we're going to have a chance to look at that. And, um, you know, there's members from this committee on the tax committee also, as we know. So I don't think that's necessary to be able to move it on to taxes. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so again, I, I hate to be a stick in the mud, but I'm going to. Uh, Representative Markford, I'm not on the tax committee. And the next time that I'll get to see this would be later in the floor. So at this time, just out of respect for the committee, Mr. Chair, I'd make a motion that we table this bill until we see those runs, hoping that we can get 100% support out of this committee. Because I think there's folks on this side that would love to vote for this, but without those numbers, uh, we can't. And so I would make the motion that we table the bill until we have that. So noted, Representative Krisha. Any discussion to the Krisha amendment, members? Representative Hewitt. Yes, and Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair. Uh, before I forget, I would like to request a roll call. Certainly. Uh, any comments on the motion to table your bill, Representative Hewitt? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, and I would ask that the committee does pass this out today. I think that uh, we've heard this bill before my time even, and um, I think it's time, if not now, when? If not us, who? And we need to move this bill. So um, I, I totally empathize with Representative Prisha, um, but I think it's time to... Uh, get this over to taxes and start getting uh, getting the work together. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hewitt. Uh, Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would just like to echo Representative Krishaw's concerns and their, my concerns as well. I don't feel like I have the information as a member of the Finance Committee to be able to uh, vote yes or no on this. I, I would like to support it actually, but I think it would be irresponsible of us not to have that information first before we make a vote, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Rep Representative Bennett, Representative Marquardt. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one more uh, comment is that uh, the target or the dollars will be carried in the tax committee. So I, I would ask members to vote no on this motion. Thank you, Representative Marquardt. Uh, Mr. With, Chair. Uh, Representative Krisha, yes. Thank you, just one final comment and, and again, Members, I'm not doing this because I don't support the bill. I think the bill is a fine idea. I'm doing this because we're being opaque to this committee. Um, there is no deadline that we're going to miss. And so what I'm actually trying to do, Representative Hewitt, is I'm trying to build 100% support on our side. I'm telling you, I can't, recommend a, uh, I, I can't recommend a yes vote without those numbers. And while Representative Marquardt, I understand the targets in your committee, but we don't see that target. And our one job, is to look at those and to have those impact statements. So that's what I'm actually trying to do is I'm trying to accomplish a more unified support going forward rather than leaving this with uncertainty. And I renew my motion. Very good. Uh, Representative Krish, I, I appreciate your respect for the jurisdiction of the committee, uh, but I do agree with Representative Marquardt that uh, property tax uh, and particularly property tax relief is the jurisdiction of the tax committee in the property tax division. And we're lucky to have the chairs of both of those committees on this committee. Uh, so I will be a no vote. But Representative Krisha, you requested a roll call. Uh, the, Mr. Lee, would you please take the roll? Thank you, and, Mr. And Chair. Mr. Chair. Oh, can Representative we just define Krisha. what a yes and a no mean? I'm sorry, just be clear. Oh, certainly. Uh, so members, a yes vote on the Krisha amendment to table. Uh, House file 3224 would be to retain the, uh, to table the bill and retain it in this committee. Uh, a no vote would allow the committee to continue forward on the consideration of the motion uh, to move it onto the tax committee. Mr. Lee, to the roll call, please. Okay, roll call voting will commence now. Uh, Chair Dabney? No. Representative Sandstead? No. Representative Krisha? Yes. Representative Bennett? Yes. Representative Daniels? Yes. Representative Damith? Yes. Representative Drevkowski? Aye. Representative Erickson? Erickson votes aye. Representative Feist? No. 
Representative Jordan. Jordan, no. Representative Marcourt. Representative Marcourt. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes Marcourt yes. votes no. Representative Marcourt, no. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes yes. Representative Mueller, yes. Representative Richardson? No. Rep Representative Richardson, no. Representative Thompson? No. Representative Thompson, no. Representative Walgamot? Walgamot, no. Representative Walgamot, no. Representative Shong? Zhang, no. Representative Shong, no. Representative Joaquin? Joaquin, no. Joaquin, no. Uh, Mr. Chair, I report we have 10 nays and seven a's. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Uh, with a vote of seven ayes and 10 nays, the motion does not prevail. Representative Hewitt, any closing comments? Uh, um, Mr. Chair. Oh, Representative Krisha. I'm sorry. Uh, so just my final comments on the bill before you go to the bill. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. members, uh, again, I really do want to try to support this, but without numbers, it's very difficult to do. So at this time, Representative Hewitt, and I know this is on to the tax committee, um, I think we're being a bit uh, opaque and we're not following the process. And I would recommend a no vote at this time. I'm sure it's gonna come back, but I wish we were doing this a little bit differently. Thank you, Representative Krisha. <clears throat> Representative Hewitt, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee. And Representative Krisha, I understand where you're coming from. I just think that there is a there is another way to, to deal with these, and that's going to be in taxes. So um, I understand where you're at, and I, I, I wish we could work through that. But today, I am really recommending a yes vote. And uh, last statement I leave you with again, because the equalization formula is based on the 1990s property value, it's time. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hewitt. With that, Representative Jordan renews uh, her motion to uh, refer House File 3224 to the Tax Committee. Mr. Lee will call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, roll call voting on HF 3224 will now commence. Chair Dabney? Uh, Chair votes aye. Representative Sandstead? Sandstead, aye. Representative Sandstead, aye. Uh, Representative Krisha? Krisha, no. Representative Krisha, no. Representative Bennett? No. Representative Bennett, nay. Uh, Representative Daniels? Daniels, vo Daniels votes no. Representative Daniels, nay. Representative Damith? Damith votes no. Representative Damith, nay. Representative Drafkowski? No. Representative Drafkowski, nay. Representative Erickson? Erickson votes no. Representative Erickson, nay. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Feist, aye. Representative Jordan? Jordan, aye. Representative Jordan, aye. Representative Marcourt? Marcourt, aye. Representative Marcourt, aye. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes no. Representative Mueller, nay. Representative Richardson? Aye. Representative Richardson, aye. Representative Thompson? Thompson, aye. Representative Thompson, aye. Representative Walgamot? Walgamot votes yes. Representative Walgamot, aye. Representative Shong? Aye. Representative Shong, aye. Representative Joaquin? Aye. Representative Joaquin, aye. Mr. Chair, I report we have 10 ayes and seven nays. Thank you, Mr. Lee. With a Vote of 10 ayes and seven nays, the motion prevails. Representative Hewitt, thank you for your time today. You're off to the tax committee. Uh, our final bill hearing, we have House File 3906, 3906 from Representative Keeler. It's our intention to refer this bill also to the tax committee by 11.59 a.m. Representative Joachim, would you like to make a motion to move House File 3906 before the committee and refer it to the tax committee? So move, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Keeler, welcome to the committee. Please introduce your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, 
House file 3906 increases the equalizing factors for both the first and second tier of local option revenue. Uh, for me, um, I care about our kids. I care about how we can support them in school. And I also care about um, how we can create opportunities for our homeowners uh, to, I guess, reduce some of their costs just a little bit. What this does, um, it just equalizes um, the, the levy part of the two-tiered effort uh, for the per pupil cost. Um, I, I jumped into this committee from another committee looking like we were in a pretty heated conversation. I believe you have all of my runs and all of the data um, that you may need for this. Um, I'm, <laughs> I have to be honest, I'm still learning all of the tax stuff. It's pretty um, in-depth. And so uh, if questions get thrown my, my way, I, I may need to uh, have nonpartisan research help with some of that. All right, Representative Keeler. Uh, there's lots to learn, so no worries. Uh, any uh, questions from members? Mr. Strom, could you uh, provide the committee with a little overview on the runs that you did provide? Mr. Chair, Representative Keeler, yes. The, in your packets, there should be a run for House File 3906. This shows the effect of increasing the local optional revenue equalizing factors. Uh, you can see this would start uh, for taxes payable in 2023. Uh, so that would uh, line up with fiscal year 24 for the aid savings. And on the printout in your packet, uh, if Ms. Burke would like to put that up, that would be fine. Otherwise you can find it there. And what the printout shows is the current law, local optional revenue per uh, uh, in total and the current aid and levy shares, and then shows that by increasing the equalizing factors, the levy share will go down by uh, about uh, $14.6 million and the aid will go up by about that amount. Uh, the last two columns on the printout then show the uh, impact on a per pupil basis, how much that uh, levy is going down per pupil. And the last column shows on a sample property with a $200,000 value what the tax relief on that would be. So if you look across by the, on the totals line there, you'll see the baseline local optional revenue at 625 million. Uh, the levy share is 539 million under baseline uh, on the 885 million. And this, this provision in House File 917 would increase the uh, aid share by about 14.6 million, uh, bringing that number to just about $100 million for the for the aid. The, the variable columns, the last two columns show that this is not evenly distributed uh, as the discussion of equalization happened earlier. Essentially for those districts with lower property tax base per pupil, they're going to get a bigger uh, uh, share of the levy reduction. And you can see the districts listed in district number order there. Representative Keeler's district, Moorhead, is district 152. And you can see the uh, if uh, Ms. Burt wouldn't mind scrolling to that page, you can see the amounts for that district that under current law, the, uh, uh, the revenue for the 7,800 students in the uh, Moorhead School District is uh, about a million dollars and is roughly split between uh, aid and levy. This bill would provide an additional $367,000 of aid in place of levy which would reduce the levy per pupil at $47 per pupil and the tax on a sample $200,000 property at about $20 of the, of the annual tax being reduced. Um, the, the column, the, uh, the equalization factor is, is compared to that second column of data. And the higher that column is, the more property tax wealth per, per pupil the district has. The lower that number is, the less property tax wealth the district has. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, Representative Keeler, in a nutshell, that's the printout that's before you for local optional revenue. Thank you, Mr. Strom. Representative Ewakin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank Representative Keeler for bringing forward this bill and being willing to dive mm -hmm. into this subject area. I know she cares very much about her schools in Moorhead, but also cares about students across the state. Um, and this would uh, really help those property poor districts. Um, have a little bit of break when we're doing the equalization to make sure it doesn't matter which zip code a child lives in, how they're educated. So thank you, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Krisha. Representative Keeler, thank you for bringing the bill. Thank you for the data. This actually gives us the data we need to show that uh, there would be a tax cut in here. This would be a straight 
uh, equalization. And I think you're on the right track. And when you have the right data and we can actually make the decision, I'll recommend a yes vote. Thank you, Representative Krisha. With that, Representative Keeler, I'd say let's make a run for the exit. Uh, any closing comments from you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, and also, thank you for the opportunity to learn and grow. Um, I care a lot about education, and this is just a new new area and new lens um, to really care about how this can impact my communities along with all of yours. Um, I appreciate the support. Thank you very much. With, with that, Representative Joachim renews her motion to refer House File 3906 to the Tax Committee. Mr. Lee will call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Roll call voting on HF 3906 will now commence. Chair Dabney? Chair votes aye. Chair Dabney, aye. Representative Sandstead? Aye. Representative Sandstead, aye. Representative Krisha? Krisha votes aye. Representative Krisha, aye. Representative Bennett? Aye. Representative Bennett, aye. Representative Daniels? Daniels votes aye. Representative Daniels, aye. Representative Damith? Damith votes aye. Representative Damith, aye. Representative Drafkowski? Aye. Representative Drafkowski, aye. Representative Erickson? Erickson votes aye. Representative Erickson, aye. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Feist, aye. Representative Jordan? Jordan, aye. Representative Jordan, aye. Representative Marcourt? Marcourt, aye. Representative Marcourt, aye. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes yes. Representative Mueller, aye. Representative Richardson? Aye. Representative Richardson, aye. Representative Thompson? Aye. Representative Thompson, aye. Representative Walgamot? Walgamot votes yes. Representative Walgamot, aye. Representative Shong? Aye. Representative Shong, aye. Representative Joaquim? Joaquim, aye. Representative Joaquim, aye. Mr. Chair, I report we have 17 ayes. With uh, 17 ayes, Representative Keeler, uh, the motion, the excuse me, you came motion prevails. You get to go to the tax committee. Thank you for bringing that bill forward. Thank you for being here today. Members, uh, we'll look forward to a, another full week next week. Thank you for your time and attention today. With that, members, enjoy the weekend. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm.